So I would like to thanks for the invitation from the organizers. And also I would like to thank Professor Bear just delivered this wonderful talks about the index theorem. And in the next hour, I will try to go into more geometric applications and in particular on the scalar curvature rigidity problems. And especially uh, as the title, I will probably mainly focus on the dihedral rigidity theorem. And everything today I will share is a joint work with Simon Brendel. And for some of you who may attend his previous lectures in the seminar a few months ago, the some of the topics might be overlap and I will also try to refer to some of the points that he also covered. So, uh, so during this lecture, I will try to begin with some introduction to this rigidity problems in scalar curvature and especially emphasizing the motivations behind this dihedral rigidity conjecture. And after that, I will briefly revisit Brendel's talk in the seminar and especially his smoothing uh, method for the same problem. And the central discussion will be around this uh, inductive smoothing procedure, which is a concept inspired by Gromov. And I will try to explain some details. And if time permits, I will try to explore some additional generalization and also other applications if possible. So let me try to begin by exploring some examples about what I mean by rigidity problems and scalar curvature. And the first example that comes in my mind is this uh, resolution of the scalar conjecture by both Sheng Yao and also Grom of Lawson. So the original Gara conjecture states that, well, on a torus, it doesn't exist, a Riemannian band. Yeah. Are you hearing me? No. Yeah. So, okay. So the, the, the original Gara conjecture states that there doesn't exist a Riemannian metric on a torus that has positive scalar curvature. And, the, and this intriguing part is, is this rigidity aspect, which states that if you have a metric with non negative scalar curvature on the torus, then it has to be flat. And another example, and especially modeled on a complete non compact manifold, is this famous positive math theorem, which is solved by Sheng Yao and Witten. And it basically says that if you have an asymptotically flat Riemannian metric on a Euclidean space with non negative scalar curvature, then it has to be flat. So for both of these two problems, there are two parallel approaches. Namely, uh, the method adopted by Sheng Yao is based on this variation techniques of minimal hypersurfaces, and in which case the regularity problem restricts themselves to look at dimension between three and seven. And Grom of Lawson and Witten was using this techniques that developed by Spinner and the Dirac operator approach, just like Professor Bear just explained in the previous talk. So now let me uh, move forward to look at manifold with boundary. So in this case, as we saw in the last talk about this rigidity of bands, is that uh, not only you need to assume the scalar curvature is not negative in the interior, but also we need to assume the boundary mean curvature has certain conditions. So a typical example is this, uh, the following theorem first observed by Miao, which can which is just follows from the positive mass theorem. So it states that if you have a Riemannian metric on a unit ball in Euclidean space, such that the scalar curvature is not negative, and the mean curvature at, is at least n minus one, which is the mean curvature of the standard sphere in the Euclidean space. And moreover, you restrict uh, your metric on the boundary and you require it to be same as the Euclidean metric on the boundary. Then if all of these three conditions happens, then you conclude that this G has the isometric to the Euclidean metric. So the theorem later is also to be generalized to arbitrary convex domain in Euclidean space by Xi and Tan, which you replace the condition of mean curvature greater or equal to n minus one on the boundary to this mean curvature of your, of your metric to be at least the mean curvature of the Euclidean metric on the boundary. And if you know this, we'll conclude that the isometry. And moreover, they study this, uh, they actually can show this integral quantity right here that 
the mean curvature of the Euclidean metric minus the mean curvature of the unknown metric has to be non-negative on the boundary. And this, and, and of course, if you, if you also know that mean curvature of your metric is at least a Euclidean one, then this quantity has to be zero. And in which case they could come, and in, and in which case you will know that the G has to be flat. And I would like to remark that, that this integral quantity is quite important and interesting in this realm of geometric relativity as it articulates some interesting concepts about quasi-local masses. Uh, so now, after that, in 2014, Gromov come in this idea to extending this rigidity results to manifold with corners and also other singular spaces. So it's quite similar in the study of Alexander geometry for sectional curvatures and this theory developed by Chigar Colding in the theory of Ricci curvature is that one should look at not only about smooth objects, but also singular objects. And a typical example that one could study is about this manifold with corner and polytopes. So Gromov made the following conjecture. So suppose that we have a compact convex polytope in Euclidean space with a Riemannian metric G, such that the scalar curvature is non-negative and all the boundary first, all the boundary faces are mean convex. And moreover, you assume that the dihedral angles with respect to your metric is less than equal to the dihedral angles with respect to the Euclidean metric. And if you assume all of these three conditions, then the conjecture is that G is isometric to the Euclidean metric. And a weaker version of this conjecture is to assume the third condition, the inequality to become an equality. So this is uh, this hypothesis is called the matching angle hypothesis, which is just states that the dihedral angles with respect to G agree with the dihedral angles with respect to the Euclidean one. Uh, so now let me just give a brief overview of some recent progress on this dihedral rigidity conjecture because there are several previous talks that already discussed about this. So one could also refer to uh, the talk by Chao Li and also Brendel in the seminar. So in 2014, when Grom made the conjecture, he has already established the case if a polytope is a cube and utilizing this asymmetrization technique. And after that, you are able to to reduce the dihedral rigidity conjecture to the Garrow conjecture, as we just discussed at the very beginning. And in 2020, uh, Chao Li demonstrated that the dihedral rigidity problem holds for all acute prisms. This is a large class of polytopes and in dimension from two to seven, and assuming this matching angle hypothesis. Uh, I would like to remark that the proof by Li employs this technique involving this variations of capillary surfaces, which can be considered as a generalization of this minimal surface approach by Shun and Yao. So there is this is also the reason why there's like a dimension constraints right here because of the regularity issues. And in 2021, uh, Wang, Xie, and Yu also studied the general case and utilizing to solve the Dirac equation, an index theory on manifold with a polyhedral boundary. And finally, in 2022, uh, Brandel proved the case in all dimensions under the matching angle hypothesis. And this is the one that I will try to go over later. And his proof is basically uh, to work on the Dirac equation on the smooth domain and the like approximation procedure. So, uh, in the four lectures, so Grove outlined a proof of the dihedral rigidity conjecture. Can I ask a Can I ask a question? Uh, sure. For the ma angle matching condition, do you assume just the dihedral angles matching, or is it just actually it's all angles matching? I think it's just the dihedral angles that they match. You. I mean, it's it's the inner product of your two normal vector with respect to the unknown metric. It's same as the inner product of two normal vector with respect to the Euclidean metric on the boundary. No, no, I I, I understand in that case, yeah, it's not a normal border, but it could be that at a vertex you have many faces, right? For example, yeah, the yeah. three at a vertex you can have say a hundred faces. 
What about yeah. uh, non-adjacent faces? Uh, we don't. We don't, we don't need to assume anything that's on a corner. So everything we need to assume is only about interior, the boundary faces and the angles only on an edge. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. We can, okay, thanks. Yeah, we could, we could also discuss that later. Um, so in the four lectures, uh, Grove outlined a proof of the dihedral rigidity conjecture for acute polytopes. So uh, his idea is the following. So first you smooth out the edges of the polytope so that you could work on a smooth domain. And the assumption regarding the angle comparison and the, and the acuteness of the polytope will ensure that after you do the smoothing, the mean curvature of your polytope will be at least the mean curvature with respect to the Euclidean metric. And once you know this, you can apply a scalar mean rigidity theorem as I just discussed, as, as I just discussed by Xi and Tan. So uh, in this recent work, joint work with Simon Brandl, we're able to present a detailed construction of Zgromov's argument. So let me try to, uh, to to explain precisely about this main theorem and probably also answer the questions. So let, let me suppose that our polytope is defined by the sublevel sets, the intersection of all the sublevel sets of this linear functions UK, and this define a compact convex domain and with an unknown Riemannian metric G. And let me and I let new k to be the G uninormal vector with respect to the level sets of UK. And I let NK, uh, that's in the unit sphere, it's, it, it's a map from the boundary to the unit sphere uh, to be the Euclidean normal vector on the, each faces. And suppose the scalar curvature of G is non-negative in the interior, and the mean curvature of each face is also non-negative. And moreover, you have this uh, angle comparison so the so the dihedral angle with respect to with respect to G is just the inner product of new of, of the new vectors, and the dihedral angle with respect to Euclidean metric is the inner product of the of the n vectors. And I need to assume that these angles are acute, which is just saying that these inner uh these inner products are less than or equal to zero. And the conclusion is once you know the three conditions then the Riemann curvature tensor of G has to be vanished. And on each uh, boundary faces, it has to be totally geodesics. And moreover, uh, the dihedral angle has to agree. But just to make sure, uh, um, Harry, uh, so this third condition, this is asked just for two faces which share an, a common edge, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so in the next part, let me try to go over Randall's proof. And I think some of the parts might be overlapped to his talk already, but I will try to uh, just give a quick, quick, quick summary. So, uh, so, so recall that his proof will be relies on this matching angle hypothesis. So the first step is you cross your polytope uh, with an interval so that you can reduce this to the case where n is off. So it's so the reason why to work on n is odd is quite similar to the previous talk as Professor Bear just discussed. When you have an all-dimensional manifold, your boundary is even, and on an even-dimensional manifold, it is easier to work on this index theory. And the reason why you can do this is because it's very easy, is because if you have an counterexample in an even dimension, then by crossing an interval, you will obtain a counterexample in an all-dimension. And then you approximate your polytope by a smooth domain. And at the same time, you need to construct a map from the boundary uh, to the sphere that is homotopic to the Euclidean Gauss map. And then on the smooth domain, you solve a suitable Dirac boundary value problem and using the index theorem that just discussed in Professor Baer's talk. 
And once you're able to solve the Dirac boundary value problem, you obtain you obtain a twisted spinner and you plug into the Weisenberg formula. And in Weisenberg formula, you have some error terms that's in approximation. And finally, you show that in the limit, this error term will converge to zero in some suitable norm. And then from that, uh, you are able to conclude rigidity at that case. So uh, let me try to go over the Dirac equation set up in the smooth domain as discussed in Professor Baer's talk. So let me suppose that n is odd and omega right now is a compact smooth domain with a Riemannian metric G. And I let nu to be the G unit normal vector on the boundary and I fix a map n that's from the boundary to the standard sphere that is homotopic to the Euclidean Gauss map. So, so in the model case, one should, one should just consider this n as the standard Gauss map. So, and also in the standard case, uh, in, in the model case, which I mean is G equals to the Euclidean metric, this nu and n will agree. And I let S and S Euclidean to be the spinner bundle of G and G Euclidean uh, respectively. So and let E to be this uh, twisted spinner bundle and D to be the Dirac operator on this twisted spinner bundle. And now let me define this boundary chirality operator to simply the minus the Clifford multiplication by nu tensor with the Clifford multiplication by n. And then it follows that this boundary chirality operator is self-adjoined and is an involution. And then it follows from the work of Baer and Bowman that this boundary value condition of uh, requiring chi of s equals to plus or minus s will form an elliptic boundary value problem for the Dirac operator d, and they are also adjoined to each other. Okay, so now let's look at this boundary value problem, which we require, uh, we solve ds equals to zero in the interior and s minus chi of s equals to zero on the boundary. And let me just restate the result that just discussed in Professor Baer's talk, which states that in this case, uh, the index for this uh, elliptic boundary value problem is just the Euler number of our manifold. And in which case, uh, in, in which case, since our omega is a contractible domain, it is uh, the index will just be one. So now we obtain this, uh, we can solve this boundary value problems and we obtain some spinner and we plug into this Weisenberg formula. And in which case the Weisenberg formula will tell you that, well, you have a sum of three terms and this is bounded by some, uh, bounded by some integral of d at square and, and some boundary the rock operator, this is this d sigma on the right hand side. And in which case, the important thing is that if s solves the boundary value problem, the entire right hand side of this expression will be zero. And notice that, well, we have like three terms on this left hand side in this Weisenberg formula. The first term is automatically non negative. The second term, since we know the scalar curvature is non negative, the second term is also non negative. So if we look at the third term, so in, in this third term, uh, this dn trace is the trace norm of the differential of the map n we just constructed. And if we, we can moreover know that h minus the trace norm of dn is not negative, then we can see that all these three terms on the left-hand side of this Weisenberg formula will be non-negative. And in particular, we can conclude that the covariant derivative of s is zero. And this means that s is a parallel spinner. And in such a case, uh, the rigidity will be followed from this condition as uh, also Professor Baer just discussed, and there are also very other classical examples that one can see. Okay, so, so far, uh, this was the discussion on smooth domain. So let me get back to the case where omega is a polytope. So let me have the polytope defined by this intersection uh, of sublevel sets of linear functions in Euclidean space. And then we need to construct a smooth approximation. So Brandel was using this uh, exponential map to define this approximation omega lambda. 
And by taking lambda large, uh, this omega lambda will be convex and will contain in this regional polytope omega. Uh, so now at the same time, we need to construct our map N from the boundary to the sphere. So this, this expression my, in the beginning looks like a mess, but the idea is that once you compare it to the unit normal vector of, of the G metric of the boundary. So the unit normal vector in this case is just a linear combination of all the boundary of all the boundary phases normal nu of k and with this coefficient that's given by this approximation uh, using the exponential function. And the idea for coming up with this n is just to take the same coefficient for the linear combination and you replace each new k by nk and you normalize it so that you will get a map uh, to, to the sphere. And one should also one should also observe that uh, in the case, if your metric is just a Euclidean metric, then this n will agree with nu. So if you deform your metric G to the Euclidean metric, you will see that n is homotopic to the Euclidean Gauss map. And this is quite crucial because in the index theorem, this is one of the condition uh, so that you can make all this index theory work. Okay. So now we have a sequence uh, of approximations. Lambda goes to infinity, and we look at our domains, omega lambda L, uh, that approaches our polytope omega. And in each smooth domain, we solve a spinner, and we plug into the Weisenberg formula. And we have this all of those three terms. So as we discussed, the first two terms is automatically non-negative. If we know that the third term is also not negative, then we will conclude rigidity from this. But um, unfortunately, on our smooth approximations, it is not so clear whether this term H minus the trace norm of dn actually has a favorable sign. But what we can show is that the error term, which I will just define as the negative parts of H minus the trace norm of dn, is quite small in some Mori norm. And a key to establish this step, uh, Brandle needs to use the matching angle hypotheses. So more precisely, is I could choose some exponent sigma that's just slightly greater than one, so that as lambda goes to infinity, this Mori norm defined by sigma will converge to zero. So after knowing this, uh, we need to adopt the Steve theorem by Pfefferman and Fong originally. So we, what, what can we say if we know the Mori norm is small? So the Pfefferman Fong estimate is basically saying that uh, if we have a non-negative function V that is defined on a manifold, uh, like on, on a manifold with boundary such as Mori norm, is let's say in this case bounded by one, then the integral of v f square on a boundary will essentially be controlled by a constant multiplied h one norm of f in the interior. In in the interior, so in particular, if we know that the Mori norm of v lambda goes to zero, that's that's the error term that we we need to estimate. Then in this integral. Uh, in this integral term in a Weisenberg formula will eventually vanish in the limit. So uh, so far this 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 was the discussion uh, about Brandel's proof, and let me summarize it uh, quickly about how does the smoothing procedure works. So the idea so the idea is just that we look at the smooth approximations omega lambda, and at the same time, we cook up this map n lambda, that's the map from the boundary of our smooth domain to the unit sphere that is homotopic to the Euclidean Gauss map. And subsequently, we need to show that uh, this error term, uh, right here, it should be dn of lambda, uh, the, this error term h minus the trace norm of dn lambda will go to zero in some Mori norm. So how to come up with this uh, smoothing function? So to smooth a polytope, 
we are essentially smoothing the maximum functions because our polytope is defined to be this intersections of sublevel sets of this linear function, which is exactly the sublevel set of the maximum functions of uh, all your linear functions together. And Brandel's idea was to using this uh, exponential function, uh, that this U lambda defined via this exponential function in this form. And I believe uh, such construction is always called, referred to the soft max function in some cases. And now I would like to introduce like another approach. Uh, this is an inductive smoothing approach. So the idea is that we are not trying to smooth the entire polytope uh, at once, but instead we smooth out each edge at each time. And finally, uh, after exactly Q steps, and you will obtain a smooth domain. So in terms of uh, smoothing this maximum functions, the idea is that while we first construct this U hat of one as a smoothing of the maximum of U zero and U one, and next, we construct the u hat of two as a smoothing of the maximum of u hat one and u two. And we iterate this process q times and we'll obtain a final smooth functions that we want. And uh, to study this smoothing approach more carefully, so let me first look at the cases uh, when we smooth two hypersurfaces. So for two hypersurfaces uh, defined by linear functions u0 and u1, the idea is that we need to construct this u hat one that approximate uh, the maximum of u0 and u1. And one idea is maybe, well, one can just use this uh, the soft max function just introduced by Brendel. But in this case, uh, the key observation is that when you smooth two functions, uh, you can make it to you can make the smoothing to have compact support. What I mean is that you can only deform it that's only in a neighborhood of the edge you are smoothing. And outside the edge, you will exactly have your original polytope. So the idea is that you could, you could express this maximum function of u0 and u1 in terms of one half of u0 plus u1 and plus the absolute value of the difference. While the absolute value function is not smooth, but we could construct a smooth even function eta such that it approximates our absolute value function that, that's in a domain that's close to zero and, and, outside, and outside a certain neighborhood of zero I let eta just to be the absolute value function. And using this uh, auxiliary function eta and rescale it, I could fix some lambda large and so that uh, my u hat can be defined in this way. So it's basically the same expression, but I replace this absolute value function using my auxiliary function eta and rescale it by lambda. And I set the new hypersurface sigma hat of one to be u hat one equals to zero. So this is like a picture that sort of illustrate uh, this construction. So this, this, this blue line right here is just this absolute value function. And the, the red line characterizes this auxiliary function eta we construct. This is required to be slightly greater than the absolute value function if the absolute value of C is like less than or equal to one and outside uh, we require it to be exactly the same as the absolute value function. And this green line is sort of this construction that is used by Brendel is to use this exponential function. Well, the thing is that when you are far, you will you you will know that this green line will be very close uh, to your absolute value function, but they are not agreed. Okay, next uh, is I would like to discuss the construction of our map n. So recall that we not only need to construct the smoothing of the hypersurface, but at the same time, we need to construct uh, this, this sort of Gauss map, that not, not exactly the Gauss map, it, it is this map N from the boundary uh, to the unit sphere. 
So we need to construct the n hat of one such that, well, after you smooth out the h, the mean curvature of your smooth hypersurface minus the trace norm of the dn is essentially small. So to do this, the key idea is to use the angle comparison condition. Well, in Brendel's case, he was using this, uh, he needs to use this ang matching angle hypothesis so that in his smoothing process, he can make this error term to be essentially small. And in our case, by smoothing two hypersurfaces, one, one can notice that we are able to construct this hat and uh, to, to this map and hat of one such that the error term is small, but only assuming the comparison on the dihedral angle. So let me interpret this angle comparison in the following way. So let me fix uh, alpha to be the inner product of nu zero and nu one, and with respect to the G metric. Uh, so the so this is basically saying the angle between nu zero and nu one is two alpha, and at the same time. Uh, I take the inner product of n0 and n1 with respect to the Euclidean metric to be a cosine of two theta of alpha. And the angle comparison is just saying that the theta is less than equal to one because we assume that uh, the inner product of nu0 and nu1 is less than equal to the inner product between n0 and n1. Uh, Harry, may I interrupt you? So there is a question by Christina, it seems. Uh, uh, Christina was showing, uh, putting up her hand, or maybe. Christina, are you? You want to ask something? Okay. It's fine. Oh, okay. So, uh, so now after we have this, we have our smooth hypersurface sigma hat of one, and I let new hat of one. Uh, to be this outward unit normal vector uh, with respect to the metric G. And notice that this new hat of one will lies in the spherical arc between nu zero and nu one. So this means that I could find some parameter S such that I could, I could express my new hat of one in the following way as a linear combination of nu zero and nu one with, with this coefficients. Well, so now we have some, uh, so, so now this is the definition of S. We could sort of mimic this construction uh, to define our map n hat of one in a similar fashion. So instead we're looking at a similar ways of representing uh, this linear combination, but we require instead of alpha plus S and alpha minus S, we bring in this angle theta inside. And notice that, uh, since since we require the inner product between n0 and n1 uh, to be exactly cosine two theta alpha, it turns out that the, this n hat of one in this expression actually has norm one. So this is sort of like uh, mimicking this idea that is for this smoothing by Brendel. Brendel was using exactly the same coefficients uh, to, to make this construction of the n hat. But right now we are not uh, doing this way, but we sort of, we need to bring in this angle condition. And let me try to explain this idea about this construction in this picture. So uh, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm just using like to, to construct this new hat of K based on new hat of K minus one and, and, and new K. Uh, it, is, it is the same for, for, for each step. So I have my new hat of k minus one and new k such that the angle between them is two alpha. I have my hypersurface so that I have this normal vector new hat of k and new hat of k lies in this arc so that exactly the angle between new hat of k minus one and new hat of k is alpha minus s and the angle between new hat of k and new k is alpha plus s. And at the same time, we have our arc that is determined by n hat of k minus one and n k, such that the angle between them is two theta of alpha. And then, and then 
you just require your n hat of k to be exactly the vector such that the angle between n hat of k minus one and n hat of k is theta alpha minus s, and at the same time, n hat of k uh, to nk has angle theta alpha plus s. So this is like sort of like a geometric interpretation about uh, the construction I just I just discussed. Okay, now uh, the proposition is that if we define our n hat of one in the way that we just discussed, then in the smoothing region, in the smoothing region, we can estimate our error in terms of a constant times lambda. Recall that lambda is the coefficient we pick uh, in our smoothing function and the difference between the angle and minus some other constant c that doesn't that doesn't depend on the smoothing parameter. And noticing that on the edge, the angle agrees. So there is basically no errors from the angle on the edge. So that means if you are close to the error, uh, to, that, that, that means if you are close to the edge, then your error has to be small. And in particular, in our smoothing region, it is, it is sort of lambda, it, it's like one over lambda close to the edge. Therefore, this angle difference can be bounded by constant times lambda inverse. And this will tell you that uh, in the smoothing region, you will have that your error term h minus the trace norm of the uh, n hat one will be bounded by a constant. So it's, it is essentially O of one. Um, Harry, are you using the acuteness assumption here? Uh, so far we're not so so far we're not using the acuteness assumption okay. mm -hmm. right here. So far we only use this uh, angle comparison condition, and and in this step we are also using the condition that uh, the boundary phases are are mean convex. Okay, so so this was the discussion into smooth out two hypersurfaces. Now we need to start iterating this process to, 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 to smooth more faces and each time. So the question is, what might go wrong when we iterate the smoothing procedure? So recall that we define u hat of k in this way, so that u hat of k minus one is the, is the smoothing function that we obtain from the previous steps. And we need to choose another parameter lambda k in the in, in the k step to, to rescale our auxiliary function eta. This was the function that approximating this absolute value function. So we define u hat k in this way. And the question is, uh, what might go wrong? Like that is not similar to the case when we smooth two hypersurfaces. So the first uh issue is that this inequality between angle does not need to hold even on the edge. So recall that in the previous step, when we, on, on our polytope, we always have this angle comparison. But now we replace our faces to be the smooth faces we just construct. So it is not necessarily true that this angle comparison will still hold after we do the smoothing, even on the edge. And second, is that this u hat of k minus one is no longer a linear function, but it's just a smooth function we construct from the previous step. So on the linear function, which just defines a plane, and on a plane, we've already know that by assumption that a mean curvature minus the, the trace norm of the, of, of the Gauss map of the phase is automatically non-negative. That's why we're able to obtain this estimate in the two hypersurfaces just like uh, Bernard ju ju just asked me this question. But right now in this inductive step, it is not necessarily true that, that we're able to estimate in such a way. But instead, uh, it is it could happen that even on the faces, we will have this error term that can only be approximated by constant times lambda to the k minus one, where this lambda k minus one supposed to be a large parameter because it, it's supposed to be this uh, smoothing parameter in the previous step. So to address these two problems, uh, the key observation is that we need to bring in this 
acuteness condition. So recall that the, the acuteness condition is just assuming that the dihedral angle with respect to both the with respect to both the Euclidean one and, and our unknown metric is, is acute. And in terms of this inner product, it is just saying that an inner product between this new j and new k and nj and nk is less than or equal to zero. And the observation is that if we know that such case holds, so the original polytope is acute, then the angle comparison will actually be preserved in the smoothing procedure if you allow a small error. And I would like to point it out that uh, this, acuteness con uh, th this acuteness condition is also uh, crucial in this proof by Chao Li for the capillary surfaces approach in dimension from three to seven. And he needs to use that as because some regularity issues of the capillary surface also requires the acuteness condition. So let me try to illustrate this uh, in the following way. So recall my definition of new hat of one, which is the linear combination of new zero and new one. And in terms of the, this coefficient, uh, that is, that is determined by S. And the same time, our construction of N hat of one is, is coming up in this following way. And then at, at the time we bring in this parameter theta. So uh, the claim is that, well, if we know that we have the angle comparison and this N zero and K and inner product of N one, the NK is less than or equal to zero, then we can actually conclude that the inner product of new hat of one and new k is less than or equal to the inner product between n hat of one and n k. So how to show this is actually it's just based on like a very simple lemma that's just using like high school knowledge of trigonometry. So it's just saying that for any t that's between zero and two alpha, and you require theta to be between zero and one, then such expression uh, sine of t over sine two alpha is, is greater than or equal to sine of theta of t over sine of two theta of alpha. So in particular, if you let t to be alpha plus s and alpha minus s in this expression, and you know that the inner product of new zero and new k is less than or equal to the inner product of n0 and nk is less than or equal to zero, then this first expression uh, in this uh, of this inner product of new hat one and new k will be less than or equal to this, this first the, this first term in expression of the inner product of n hat one and nk. And similarly for the second term, if you if you take t to be alpha minus s. Uh, in this expression. So based on this simple lemma, when act, one can actually see that if you know that the acuteness of the polytope, then this angle comparison will be preserved in this uh, smoothing procedure. So now uh, let me discuss how to exactly preserving this uh, smoothing condition. So uh, by what we just discussed, we choose a large parameter lambda i and such that, uh, so, so we fix this some small parameter epsilon first, and then we choose the sequence of parameters lambda i large. And from the previous lemma, it will guarantee that uh, by choosing this lambda i large enough in our smoothing procedure, this angle comparison condition uh, which is the first inequality here, uh, will be preserved under uh, you allow a small error term epsilon. And the second inequality is this acuteness condition itself. And by the same argument as we just as we just discussed, this condition will also be preserved if you allow a small error term. So as in the case for two hypersurfaces, once you know this uh, angle comparison, you are able to estimate this uh, this this norm of the error term. 
But then recall that we have another issue is that on, on this boundary phases, uh, we have basically, essentially we have the error from the previous step, which is essentially of the order of lambda to the k minus one. So in the case step of the smoothing, uh, this error term can be controlled by constant times epsilon times lambda k and another term of constant times lambda k minus one. So this suggests that we would like to choose our parameter in a way such that lambda k minus one over lambda k has order of epsilon. So basically, uh, so basically how to, uh, let me try to be more precise about this choosing of parameters. So the first step, we fix some gamma small, and I fix some lambda zero large, and I'm able to choose this lambda k inductively. So the lambda one is just lambda zero, and I choose lambda k that is way larger than lambda k minus one, such that lambda k minus one over lambda k is just gamma. Then the claim is that for each gamma, we could choose some lambda zero large, such that in the k step, uh, we have this estimate uh, of h hat of k minus the trace norm of uh, d n hat of k is bounded by c times gamma times lambda k, where gamma here is assumed to be a, a small constant. So in particular, the c is independent of gamma and lambda zero. So, so far, this is what we obtained about this pointwise estimate. So to make our estimate more efficient, we need to break our polytope into different regions. Well, recall that in the in the in this Brendel's proof that we need to estimate this Mori norm. And we need to show that this Mori norm tends to zero. So right here, we're basically doing the same thing. So we obtain some uh, estimates of the error term. But it turns out that it is not that on the entire polytope, the error term is in, is in that order. Which, so actually, in most of the cases, in, in most of the places of the polytope, we have like a better error term. So let me try to explain this part. So I let fi to denote the region that's sort of approximating the phases of the polytope that is given by the function ui. Then recall that our smoothing function is making to be compact supported so that in this approximated region of the phases, the smoothing actually doesn't happen. So it is actually just the original polytope. And then we will have that H, uh, we will we'll automatically have this, uh, this term will be actually positive, uh, will be non-negative on each phases. And next, I let ejk denotes the region that approximating the edge that is given by uj and uk. And this is quite similar to the case uh, as we discussed for two hypersurfaces, because in that region, you only basically smooth it once. And it's basically around that region, the picture you look at is just the smoothing of two hypersurfaces. And as we just discussed, uh, in such a region, the error is bounded just by a constant on most parts of uh, the EJK region. And finally, I let GIJK denotes the region approximating by the corner given by at least UI, UJ, and UK, since, I mean, on a corner, you can certainly have, have more phase, but it at least have, have three phases intersect. So I'm just picking the largest IJK right here to denote this uh, region. Then uh, this is the case when we don't have a very good estimate, but will be enough for our proof is that as in the previous page, we can show that this error term is bounded by constant times gamma times lambda k in this corner. So to estimate this Mori norm, uh, we are also need to using the fact that the area of this region when you have an error, it's small in some sense. So in particular, we can exactly show that if R is at least lambda uh, one over lambda zero, 
lambda zero is the parameter we fixed for making our smoothing parameters lambda, uh, lambda one, lambda two, so on and so forth. And then we could estimate this area uh, of EJK intersects a ball of radius R by constant times one over lambda K times R to the N minus two. So this is small in some sense because it has a sort of like order of co-dimension two. And similarly, we're able to estimate this area of the corner intersect a ball of radius R so that it can be controlled by constant times one over lambda k and one over lambda zero times r to the n minus three. And in particular, this is of order of co-dimension three. So uh, to illustrate this decomposition of the region, let me try to explain it using this picture. So in, in this picture, I'm just using a simple three-dimensional cube and my fi, fj, and fk denotes that this region on most part of the faces. On most part of the faces, the smoothing, uh, there, there isn't actually smoothing happen right here because one would just have the original polytope. And along the edge is just this blue region. And the blue region as uh, will be, in this case, will certainly have a order of dimension one in in such case. So in the in the three-dimensional cube, this is of co-dimension two. And this corner G I J K will essentially of order of co-dimension three. So uh combine everything together, well combine everything, which I mean is the is the pointwise estimate in these different regions and also the estimate of the area of uh, the edges and the corners. We're able to estimate the Mori norm efficiently. So we fixed an exponent that's uh, slightly greater than one. And I fix some gamma small at the beginning, then I can choose lambda zero large enough such that this Mori norm is bounded by constant times gamma to a positive power. And in particular, this constant C is independent of both gamma and lambda zero. So once you know this, you can take in a sequence of uh, gamma L goes to zero. And at the same time, you can take a sequence of lambda zero goes to infinity. So that you approve, so so that it will goes to your original polytope, and you will see that from this estimate that a Mori norm will eventually tends to zero, and then the rest of the proof will follow exactly as uh, Brendel's talk that using this Pfefferman phone estimates to actually kill the error term in the limit. So this will finish the proof of my main theorem. Can I ask how much time do I left? Um, you still have five minutes. Okay. Uh, so if I still have five minutes, then I could sort of discuss some uh, generalizations and applications. Uh, so the idea is that, well, so far, those theorems and examples we just discussed are all just rigidity theorems for scalar curvature non-negative. But then why could, one can also try to look at, instead of scalar curvature greater or equal to zero, but scalar curvature greater or equal to, but let's say just bounded from below. And a typical example is this, uh, is this mean all positive mass theorem in hyperbolic space. So it is quite similar than the positive mass theorem that I just discussed at the beginning of this talk, which states that if you have an asymptotically hyperbolic metric, G, and with scalar curvature at least minus n times n minus one, and this is the scalar curvature of the model case, then you suppose that G is the standard uh, hyperbolic metric outside a compact set, then you will conclude that uh, the G actually has constant sectional curvature minus one. And to address the rigidity of polytope in this case, uh, such a such a situation is actually also studied by Chao Li. So he showed that in dimension from n from three to seven, and you let uh, p tilde to be 
uh, polytope in uh, a minus one Euclidean space, and you define a hyperbolic polytope by crossing an interval uh, from your this uh, co-dimension one polytope P tilde, and you assume that uh, the scalar curvature is at least minus n times n minus one. And on P, you assume the mean curvature as at least n minus one on the top face, and you assume that the mean curvature is at least minus n minus one on the bottom face. And then on the rest of the face, you assume that the mean curvature is at least zero. And it turns out that this is the right assumption of the mean curvature that you need to that you need to address uh, to make this rigidity conjecture. And he also needs to assume this matching angle hypothesis is satisfied. And once you know this, you will see that this P, G has to be isometric to the hyperbolic polytope. And uh, finally, uh, what I would like to share is an example, or one can treat this also as a generalization of this uh, hyperbolic rigidity theorem. And this is uh, the result uh, by Brando Chow, and also independently by Tsum, but in the special case when you have a three-dimensional cube, is you look at, uh, instead of in a Riemannian case, but also uh, in relativity, one may interesting is this, you assume this an initial data set with the dominant energy condition. So suppose that you have an at least three, an odd, and you have a Come, you, you let omega to be a compact convex polytope, and you define an initial data set G and Q. So the initial data set is just Riemannian metric G and with a symmetric two tensor Q on it. And from that, you can define uh, this constraint uh, the, from the constraint equation. So we'll define the local mass and current density mu and J in this following way. And a condition you assume is that. Uh, the first condition mu minus the norm of J is at least zero. This is so-called the dominant energy condition in the interior. And you assume that uh, the corresponding the, the corresponding mean curvature condition uh, on each phases of your initial data. And third, you assume the matching angle hypothesis is satisfied. Then in such situation, uh, you can conclude that your initial data set can be actually embedded into a Minkowski space with exactly Q to be the second fundamental form. And in particular, you have mu equals to the norm of J equals to zero. So the special case where Q is just uh, equal, this Q is a symmetric two tensor. If you just require Q to be G, then this will reduce us to this hyperbolic uh, dihedral rigidity theorem just discussed uh, by Charles Lee. And yeah, I guess I will stop here. And uh, thanks for your attention and let me know if there are any questions.